Jago and Lightfoot, Series 2. Exceptionally bad feeling about this place. Roll up, gentlemen and ladies, roll up! Welcome to Deuteronomy's Theatre de Fantasy! Mr. Saunders. Saunders? Never heard of the fellow. Who is he? I have, as you know, devoted my life to studying these devilish creatures of the night. What hellish place is this? A resting place for the ancient dead. Professor Lightfoot, you can come out of the shadows now. Mr. Jago could be rather excitable. Henry, you'll get us both shot. A whole city ripe for the feasting. Uh, Professor, not now, Henry. Professor, I really think you should take a look behind you. I fear we have company. Uh, they're right behind us. Oh, oh, oh. George, George, hold on, Lily. They've got the professor. <laughs> Hello and welcome YouTubers and Doctor Who fanatics to another Big Finish audio review and today I'm continuing my review series of the Jago and Lightfoot range with Series 2 featuring Lightfoot and Sanders by Justin Richards, The Necropolis Express by Mark Morris, The Theatre of Dreams by Jonathan Morris and The Rufian Inheritance by Andy Lane. So if you want to go straight to my review of Series 2 of Jago and Lightfoot and want to see how this audio is showcased then there is the time on the bottom of the screen. If you have or haven't skipped, then let's begin the video. For the front cover, we have Jago, Lightfoot, and then Gabriel Sanders in the middle up top playing the main villain of the story. Two characters by there and bats in the background. With London by here is a nice creepy red mist, the Jago and Lightfoot logo from the worlds of Doctor Who, and then Christopher Benjamin, Trevor Baxter, and Series 2 in a silver banner. Looks like a frame effect, and then we've got some wood texture effect. For the top, we have the Jago and Lightfoot logo printed by there, and then down at the bottom, we have the running time, which is 250 minutes of prox and other bits of information. And for the side of the box set, what it looks like on the shelf, we have the Jago and Lightfoot logo and the Roman numeral for number two. And for the back, it's starring the main characters featured in the story, showcasing them. And then the four stories you get in the set, including a short bio on each of them. And then we have the spines of all the single releases which are much more creative than the ones on series one. It's just a red leather effect. We've got some nice colour on these ones with the Jacob and Lifer logo, the name of the story, then the number and the big finish logo. So that was the box set showcase and I'm going to showcase the individual stories. The first story is Lightfoot and Sanders by Justin Richards. We have a vampire out front on the cover, the Jacob and Lifer logo fire in the background and a bunch of insects and bugs down below. These are very simplistic covers, they are grown on me actually. I also do like the ones and they're very simplistic from series 1 and they invert back to series 6, I like those ones as well. Probably these ones as it just showcases more of the story. And for the back of the CD we actually got a matchstick by there, the name of the story, written by Justin Richards, directed by Lisa Bowman, the bio on the story and the cast list. And then we at the back we have character bios by there. And then Life and Sanders disc. If we take the disc out, it just shows the cover, the front cover again. And for the leaflets, we have writer's notes by Justin Richards or an introduction and behind the scenes picture. For the second story in the set is The Necropolis Express by Mark Morris. Might be my favourite cover out of the set. Again, it's very simplistic with the express train by there. The Jago and Life at logo and a bunch of hands trying to grab out at the train. And here's the back of it, just the same as Lightfoot and Sanders back cover but in a different colour. And inside we had the booklet and the disc. And for the leaflet we have a nice picture of Trevor Baxter and Christopher Benjamin, an introduction from Mark Morris and then another behind the scenes picture with the main villain of this story by there. For the third story in the set it is The Theatre of Dreams by Jonathan Morris. And again I really like this effect by here. Here we have Madame Deuteronomy and Fosco the Harlequin Clown. And for the back of the Theatre of Dreams, it's designed a little bit different from the other ones as they have these squares by here, but it just has curtains to do that. So a nice different design to make it look quite unique. And for inside, we have the leaflet and the disc with a nice picture of Trevor Baxter, David Collins and Christopher Benjamin. And inside we have the introduction and writer's notes from Jonathan Morris and another nice behind the scenes picture. And for the final story of the set, we have The Rufin Inheritance by Andy Lane this big demon creature 
at the front of the cover. Looks like he's eating the house. It looks a really nice effect when you actually have it. And here we have the back in green. Just the same design as Lightfoot and Sanders in the Necropolis Express. And inside we have the leaflet and it has series credits. And when we open it up we have introduction from Andy Lane. And another behind the scenes picture with David Collins, Simon Williams, Trevor Baxter and Christopher Benjamin. And yeah this is a two disc set with the Rufin Inheritance. Then behind the scenes which says contain spoilers by there. And coming soon which is series 3. And you can tell this one is a different artwork because it was designed a lot different, well actually a bit different when it actually came out. So that was the entire Jago and Lightfoot Series 2 set showcase. Now I'll be moving into my review part of the video, starting with Lightfoot and Sanders by Justin Richards. But aren't vampires supposed to be inhumanly strong? Oh, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a common misconception. I have, as you know, devoted my life to studying these devilish creatures of the night. Now to my review of Lightfoot and Sanders by Justin Richards, and he did a really good job with The Bloodless Soldier, that was my favourite out of series 1 of Jago and Lightfoot, and I was expecting this one to be just as good. And this story looks quite Hammer House of Horror by the start of the story, and it has vampires in it, so what can possibly go wrong with this one? And yeah, Dr. Tob is out of the picture, no longer the big guy. Now we have Dr. Gabriel Sanders, played by the amazing David Collins, who is a fantastic voice actor. Now to the opening summary of this story, Series 1, The Similarity Engine, ends on a cliffhanger with reports of numerous amount of deaths where bodies are completely bloodless, and this is a lot worse than the bloodless, we're dealing with vampires. And yeah, Lightfoot wants to do this investigation without Jago getting into the situation and wants to meet up with an old colleague, which is Gabriel Sanders, hence the title Lightfoot and Sanders. So that opens up some very interesting counter interactions that Lightfoot doesn't want to pick Jacob to do this but wants to push him away from all that and gets Gabriel Sanders to do the investigation with him. Yeah, Justin Richard does a lot more different approach to a villain in this one as what he did with Dr. Top in The Blood of the Soldier, he made him like this mysterious figure not getting to the story too much but being rather devious in the background and the shadows whereas Gabriel Sanders just really gets into the story and playing a very sinister and creepy approach and we have a nice big picture of him, not all of it, and he does flipping fantastic in this. I can say that right from the get-go, it's David Collins. And yeah, his biggest roles in this set is Lightfoot and Sanders and the Rufin Inheritance. So that was the brief opening summary of Lightfoot and Sanders and I'll be moving into my in-depth review, then characters and performances, then overall verdict, next story, and yeah, that's how I flow in my box set reviews. So let's begin my in-depth review. Yeah, Justin Richards yet again plays about with Jago and Lightfoot, just like in The Blood of the Soldier, really well by pushing the characters out of the boundaries, looking at both their strengths as characters. And here it gets very interesting what Justin Richards does with Lightfoot and Jago. As I said, Lightfoot doesn't want to do this investigation with Jago, but with Sanders. It does seem that Justin Richards' work is strongest within this range, I've just noticed that. In Doctor Who, he is good with Darkness of Glass and all that, but here it really just shows his strength, and I wish he did it with all his other stories, because it proves he is a very talented writer. Sergeant Quick does quite a lot to do in this story, and plays a side with Jager, which I do really like, and he was pushed quite away with the Bloodless Soldier, and Series 1, he had bits to do, but nothing too much, but he had a nice role in this with Jago. It's pretty much Life and Sanders, Jago and Quick. And I do love one of the lines where Jago says something like this. After all the times we've spent Quick, the adventures we've had, the dangers we've faced Quick, I am mortified Quick, wounded to the Quick, Quick. It's just some fun dialogue, because Quick um, doesn't want Jago to be pushed into this, as Lightfoot told Quick not to let Jago fall into all this vampire bloodless business. But then Quick is actually quite worried about the Sanders character, as he finds him very weird and very strange and something quite evil about him. And that's where Quick wants to team up with Jago to find out who this Sanders chap is. Yeah, this story has one of my most favourite scenes from the entire series so far, where Jago is listening at Lightfoot and Sanders' conversation, I think he's in a cabinet or something, or a different room. And where Quick tries to cover up that Jago wasn't actually there, but it was just a cleaner. And then Jago in this room or cabin accidentally knocks over pans or something and goes, Oh, corks! And 
sound is like one of the devil's are. Jago is a huge amount of fun in this one, and I love it when he tries to spy on Sanders and Lightfoot. One of the best scenes from Sanders is in this story, where he toys about and tricks this character named Mags, who is apparently blind, and Sanders begins to trick her, and he is a little bit devious, really tricking her, it's really good stuff. I would say Jago and Sanders are the highlight of the story, because Jago is so funny when he's spying on the two, and his dialogue is just absolutely brilliant and Sanders is just creepy and sinister. They're the two highlights of this story. In the middle of Life and Sanders it plays a rather interesting scene with Jago and Life. As I said Justin Richard is really good with playing with the main characters. He does so good with them. And this is why I like Justin Richard's Jago and Life stories. If you listen to The Blood the Soldier and Life and Sanders he might do the same thing with the other stories he's done in the future. But definitely the Brother Soldier in Lightfoot and Sardis, he really plays about with them very well. And yeah, this story ends really well. Got some really good writing in there. And something happens at the end of this release, sorry, this story, which becomes a little bit of an overarching thing. I'm not really going to dive into that. It involves a certain character. Actually, I don't think it's a spoiler who the character is. Ellie has a lot to do in this release. And I'm not going to say what happens in this one, and it does become an overarching thing throughout the series. So for characters and performances, we'll cover Jago and Lightfoot. Great job to both Christopher Benjamin and Trevor Baxter playing a really good job. Him tracking down Lightfoot and Sanders is absolutely fantastic. Interesting character interactions with the two of them. And Justin Richards written them extremely well looking at both their strengths as characters as Jago is determined and will never give up to protect his friend. That is some really good moments. And Lightfoot being Really clever, no one to underestimate. Next character it is Sergeant Quick by Conrad Asker contribute to the story quite a lot. He was rather underused in series one, which was quite unfortunate, as I do like Sergeant Quick a lot. And yeah, he got quite a lot to do in this one, which is fun, especially with Jago. And for the villain, we have Gabriel Sanders, David Collins, who is just extremely intimidating, very sinister foe and makes Dr. Tob look like nothing to be honest. Sanders is just fantastic. Perfect from David Collins. And for supporting characters, quite limited on this one, we have Mags who is Chloe Hellman. Nice character and some scenes with her with Sanders. It's really creepy and extremely sinister. Sanders is a, it's one of the best scenes of this story. Oh actually I forgot Ellie playing a little role in this story but something happens to her and becomes an overarching thing. And the landlord, the last one, who I believe is Alex Madison. Nothing, just one scene in the Red Tavern. So then, what is my final verdict on Lightfoot and Sanders? Well, it's a perfect start for the series. I was overwhelmed. It's got great energy, great characters. Justin Richard has got some seriously good, talented writing right by here. Really playing about with the main characters, Jigo and Lightfoot, looking at both their characters' strengths. With Jago being very determined and Lightfoot being very clever and no one to underestimate. And really showcases Gabriel Sanders to be this really big, sinister and intimidating foe. And it's, a, it's a perfect start for the series. And well done to Justin Richard, you have done your first perfect audio. And that's very hard for a writer to get. 10 out of 10 for Lightfoot and Sanders. I've rated quite a lot of 10 out of 10s recently. Home Trues. Yeah, I know this one. But yeah, it's nice to have more tens pop up. So that was Lifer and Sanders. Now we'll be moving on to the second story after set by Mark Morris, the Necropolis Express. Desolate sort of place. It is a graveyard, but it does seem somewhat neglected. Now to my review of the Necropolis Express by Mark Morris and. Yeah, okay, didn't do very well with Moonflesh. That's one of my least favourite monthly range audio. As it was just very dull storytelling. But I was still excited about this one. It's a different range. I've only listened to one story by Mark Morris. Don't judge a writer on one story. Everyone has their duds. This one can turn out brilliant. Yeah, when I looked at the cover, I think it really excited me. As I think it was going to be quite of an under siege story. With like zombies or creatures attacking the train when it's in a different dimension. Something like that. And it really intrigued me, like good old 60s Under Siege, it would have been great. But what I was actually expected turned out it wasn't actually that. 
So yeah, it's the summary of the story. Jago and Lightfoot leave London to catch a private train to go and find information on Ellie. As yeah, as I said, Ellie becomes quite a big thing in this set, what happened in Lightfoot and Sanders. And once they leave the train, they end up in a completely different place and not where they were supposed to go. And yeah, we get some very nice and new character development for Lightfoot's character when they go into this destination. So that was the brief summary of the Necropolis Express. Now to my in-depth review. Yeah, Jago and Lightfoot in this audio are pretty much with each other throughout the entire thing. And some writers like to do that, and others like to split them apart doing their own thing, and then they join back together again. But it's nice to have a bit of variation as Lightfoot and Sanders at times they were doing their own thing, uh, Necropolis Express were with each other throughout the whole thing. Same with Theater of Dreams and then the Rufian Inheritance are doing their own thing. Just has a bit of variety in the set. I would say I was slightly disappointed. It didn't turn out what I wanted it to be a like a base under siege sort of thing with zombies attacking a train when it's in a different dimension. That's what you would think of when you're looking at this cover, but no it's not. I would say the story takes a slight fun approach, but in places it can be quite dark and pretty bleak. As it's got some serious storytelling embedded within the story, I see it to be sort of fun, like with the sound design and the zombies, I think it's just like a fun sort of creepy story in a way. As it's got a very creepy vibe and atmosphere. And if Jago and Life it was a TV series, I can very much see this one to actually work. And with the monsters roaming about, they're not named, but I'm just going to call them zombies. And we have an introduction to a character, which is Reuben Maud, who is a rather funny character, I quite like him. And the way he talks by Vermin Dubseth. I hope I'm saying that name right. Yeah, it turns out a bit of a mystery story with Maud. You can see where it's going, as it only has really one other character. So you can really tell where this story is actually going. But you can see this Maud character be quite odd, and why is he living here with all these monsters lurking about? I'm not going to say anything about Ellie, but she has quite a big thing in this story, and it's quite shocking what happens in this one. Yeah, it gets really gruesome towards the end. Yeah, it really surprised me. Quite dark and bleak stuff by the. Wasn't expecting that to happen at all, but I love bleak stuff, I do. And yeah, we have more of Lightfoot's past get revealed and with uh, Maud's real name and some really good stuff. And Maud reminds me of Anx McQueen's Masters, just how he speaks seems very similar to Anx McQueen's Masters, so if you love that master then I think you may like this villain as I find their dialogue quite quirky but yet quite dark and intimidating. Then we do get the full picture of Maud's plan and we do seem to be a very good threat, not on the level with Gabriel Sanders, no way. But still a very good villain for this story. But yeah, Gabriel Sardis is being built up in this story. It's taking rather a Doom Coalition sort of way, as the Eleven was in the first story, he wasn't in the other two stories, but then he was in the final, so it's, it's taking that similar build up. He's actually in all the stories, but just taking a rather backseat approach with the Necropolis Express and Future of Dream. It is building him up for the final story, so I think it does it a lot better, the build-up, than Doom Coalition with the Eleven, a lot more better in Jago Knife at Series 2. Yeah, the final scene from, I believe, is Track 12 to the end is just incredible with some brilliant direction. It's funny, entertaining, very surprising in some places, so well done to Mark Morris. And I just look at this one, I can tell that Mark Morris is a good writer, He's done a lot of BBC books, I haven't read any of his yet, but they might be good. And I really like Jago and Lightfoot working as a team and protecting Ellie, even though there's something happening with her quite severe. No two characters and performances, Jago and Lightfoot working great as a team in this one, never backing down and to protect Ellie. So some really nice, beautiful scenes. And yeah, Lightfoot is explored a little bit more and his past in this one, which I quite like. Next character is Ellie. I'm going to stay silent on Ellie throughout this entire set. It's something that you should find out. It is an overarching thing, as I said for the fifth time. But yeah, Lisa Bauman does really good in this story, especially during the end. She's quite a good, versatile voice actress. She is just like, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Robbie Stevens or John Banks. She does very well at pretty much anything. But yeah, Lisa Bauman, of course, got some great talents. And for the main villain of the story, we have Maud. 
a good villain, not Sanders level as I said, but still I like him, very Alex McQueen style master a little bit. He's got funny dialogue, yet he's very intimidating. And I guess I can talk about Sanders just a little bit, he's being built up as I said. He's not in the story's plot, but he is connected somehow. And it feels like it's only going to get better for Sanders when he's going to be in the final story of the set. And lastly we have the station manager just a scene or two, which is Alex Madison, who seems to do a lot of voice acting in this range and covers, so it may be his favourite range or something like that. But yeah, just a scene or two. But he plays like a bigger character in The Future of Dreams playing Fosco. So then, overall, what did I think about the Necropolis Express? Wow, it's brilliant. So well done to Mark Morris. It's fun, yet it's very dark, bleak, and serious, and it's all balanced out really well. I thought this was going to be the weakest from the set, but no, it's not. It's not the weakest from the set. Even though I was disappointed that it wasn't going to be a base under seashore thing, with zombies attacking a train, or anything like that, it's completely different, yet, even though I was disappointed about that, it proved me wrong, and it was a brilliant story. My first rating of this was an 8.5 out of 10, but on a second and a third listen, I absolutely love it. It's such a good story, and I give it a 9 out of 10. Very good stuff by Mark Morris. Fun, creepy, and very bleak in some places. So that was the Necropolis Express. Next up it is the third story of the set, The Theatre of Dreams by Jonathan Morris. Come on Jonathan Morris, you're a great writer. You should deliver us a really good one. Roll up, gentlemen and ladies, roll up! Welcome to Deuteronomy's Theatre de Fantasy! Now to my review of The Theatre of Dreams and out of the set, this was the one I was most looking forward to as Jonathan Morris is my favourite Big Finish writer. He did good with the Spirit Trap, it was my least favourite out of the set of Series 1, and I know Jonathan Morris is capable of doing so much more better. Even though the Spirit Trap was an 8 out of 10, it was a good story, but Jonathan Morris's level is usually a 9 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10, that's where he usually sticks. So to the opening summary of the story, there's a new theatre where apparently dreams and wishes, people's past and secrets can come into reality and this is performed by Madame Deuteronomy and Fosco played by Alex Madison and the story has quite a lot of psychological storytelling and it does really play about and toy and play tricks on the main characters which I really do like and I was hooked. So that was the opening summary now I'll dive into my in-depth review. Now this one takes a much different approach with Jonathan Morris writing stories as he usually writes bleak, serious, epic or action packed sort of stories and occasionally does his light hearted ones and this I would say is light hearted but got psychological storytelling in the mix of it. In my personal opinion with Jonathan Morris his strongest style is with his action packed, epic scale, serious storytelling and it does top his light hearted stories. But anyway, I digress, he's still a really creative and experimental writer and it was the one I was supposed to be looking forward to out of the set and I was expecting it to be a 9 out of 10 or over. I gotta say, the voice acting in this one is so superb, it's so inviting, it's so full of energy, I love it, especially for Madame Deuteronomy. Yeah, performances on this one are perfect right at the top, they, just, they feel like they're really enjoying this audio. And I do love it when they perform on stage, it reminds me a little bit of stage frights with the Valyard. But we have the two characters which is Madame Deuteronomy and her assistant, the Harlequin clan Fosco. It has a bit of supernatural storytelling and very clever as it moves on. What Jonathan Morris usually always does really well is right from the start the plot is immediately interesting. And he does it with this one as well, he always does it Jonathan Morris. The story is seriously interesting so fast, this very old conversation going on as Lightfoot can see himself talking to another character which happened yesterday. As I said it really plays about with the characters as this theatre can bring things from reality such as people's past and that's what the story starts out with. If you wonder what's happening with Ellie, she's still playing the same role. What? happened to her in the Necropolis Express and will be resolved for Ellie 
that overarching thing in the Rufin Inheritance. Yeah, she's in, in the background of this story, but still connected to the Theatre of Dreams story. Oh, and we do have an occurring character, one of my favourite characters of the series so far, which is Dr. Saka. And he enters series two, I was so happy to hear him again, I loved him in The Beloved Devil. I forgot his name, but I'll look at the back cover in a minute or so, and if I can remember it by myself. But yeah, in series one he was great in The Beloved Devil, and he's just as good in The Theatre of Dreams. His dialogue is just so funny, and I just love hearing him. And he's also in The Roof and Inheritance, so it's nice to have more of Dr. Saka. Now I've just remembered it, I think it's Duquesne Wisbley who voices Dr. Saka. And yeah, Saka gets some great interactions with Sergeant Quick, which we didn't really have in The Beloved Devil, and with Jago and Lightfoot quite a lot, as they're the ones really on the theatre and playing the biggest part. But it plays some fantastic tricks on you and the listener. I very much love it. Very unpredictable this story is. Some really clever twists, really good stuff by Jonathan Morris. And this is where the psychological storytelling really comes into play. Tricking on the characters, you as a listener, and some perfect storytelling. This story is very much made for audio, as I could never see this happening on a TV story. If it was a Doctor Who story, I would never see this to be happening it's too. It works so good as an audio. But if it existed as a TV story, for example, I, I don't know really. It's because it's such a odd and clever story. It's a bit hard to say. And we have some nice character interactions and really good stuff with Lightfoot and Ellie during the end. Seriously good scenes. And yeah, overall, Jonathan Morris delivers another great story he usually always does. Now two characters and performances, Jake and Lightfoot, each with each other throughout the story and with Dr. Saka and uh, what the devil. Oh yeah, Sergeant Quick. I don't know how I forgot that name. They really get into the plot very well. And I love the interactions with all four of the characters on stage. And for supporting characters, we have the amazing Dr. Saka, Duquesne and Wispley. Nice to see him back again, and a nice role within the story with Sergeant Quick. Contributes to the story and the plot very well. So yeah, good stuff from Duquesne Wispley. And for the two villains, we have Madden Deuteronomy and Fosco the Harlequin Clown, Jenny Stoller and Alex Mallison. Both really good villains, very original about bringing people's dreams, pasts, and secrets into reality. And Alex Madison doing quite a lot in this story, so I do like that. And in Sanders, he's built up to the max in this one, at his highest point, and is waiting to be unleashed in the Ruth and Inheritance. The build-up for him is really good. So then, what is my final verdict on the Theatre of Dreams? Overall, this story is absolutely fantastic, out of this world, very original, experimental, clever, fun, enjoyable, supernatural, psychological, and I just absolutely loved it completely. I have to be honest, on my first listen, I felt a little bit lost what was going on. And I would say, yeah, you do require full attention, you have to be in the mood for this one, I would say. Perhaps when I listened to it on my first listen, or maybe I was tired or something, I don't know. I rated it 8 out of 10 on my first go, but on my second go, I gave it a 9. And on my third, I gave it a 9.5. So yeah, overall, it is a 9.5 out of 10. Why didn't you Jonathan Morris? I won't give it a 10, though. I don't think it just reaches that. But still, Jonathan Morris delivers a good story, as he always does in the 9 to the 10 area. So that was the Theatre of Dreams. Now let's move on to the final story of the set, to the Rufin Inheritance by Andy Lane. Do this to a person. That's what I've been trying to find out. These deaths, they're, they're little more than butchery. That my name is Ruthven, Lord Cornelius Ruthven. Well, Andy Lane is doing the final story again. He did the Similarity Engine, Series 1. It could have been better, but it was still a really good story. But I wanted this one to be even more stronger than the Similarity Engine, as it did get a few things wrong. So I hope Andy Lane would improve on that and then get a really satisfying ending for the set. Because as of now, this set has been probably one of my favourite Big Finish experiences. All these stories are so highly rated by me. A 9 out of 10, a 9.5 and a 10. So it would be whopping if this one got a 9 or higher. And again, this one looks quite creepy a hammer horror story 
and the build up for Sanders is so high and it's all going to be unleashed in this one so I was very optimistic that this set is going to probably be one of the best things in my collection. So to the opening summary of the story, Professor Lightfoot and Saka are called at the Rufin inheritance to catalog the bones underneath the house by Lord Rufin. And yeah, we have the two big guys of the set now, which is Lord Rufin and Gabriel Sanders in this finale. It was shaping out to be absolutely brilliant. So that was the opening summary of the story. Now to my in-depth review. For the start of the story, it has much more deaths happening, with bodies completely bloodless, and it is building up very nicely to Sanders. Great build up. I was expecting him to pop up in this story fairly quickly, even the whole thing maybe. But he gets introduced rather late, it's like the halfway mark, and I wish it was a little bit earlier because we had so much build up for the entire set. I just wanted him to be unleashed really quickly but um no it isn't unfortunately it's in the middle and i just wish it was just pushed a bit earlier is all i'm saying yeah ellie now is a much stronger focus what's going on with her i think that's why the Reuben plot sort of takes quite a while before that gets into gear with lightfoot and ellie having some scenes together so the Reuben plot takes a while before that gets into gear it starts off with jago and lord Rufin doing some sort of deal, well Jago is not sure about it as now he owns the theatre from the events of the theatre of dreams and it's wanting to be sold for a business deal for housing. Yeah Lord Rufin is a very interesting character going from place to place, he starts off with Jago and then he goes to Lightfoot and Saka about checking his house in the chambers to study and catalogue the bones underneath, apparently his ancestors and his family. And yeah, Lightfoot decides to bring Saka with him. So the plot is divided with Jago doing one thing, and then Lightfoot and Saka doing another thing. And it focuses on Lightfoot and Saka a lot more when they're cataloging the bones. So that suspense and build up for Sanders is still taking far too long. And it feels quite tedious waiting for him. And the build up is feeling it's just like it's losing it. It took far too long for him to enter this story, and that's that's my first negative of this box set. Five or ten minutes earlier is what I wanted. And yes, something happens to a certain character, I'm not going to say who it was, but I did not expect it. And at the same time when this incident happens, the Reuven family and the ancestors, the bones, the cataloging is fully explained. And yeah, you can sort of see what Rufin and Sanders are up to. Yeah, when we learn about Lord Rufin, this is where Sanders get into gear. So I was saying to myself, finally, more Sanders action. And we do get now the full picture of Gabriel Sanders. And he's a, a lot more from what he seems to be. When he really shows himself, I wouldn't say he's sinister, but he's a massive threat. Yeah, his voice becomes a lot more demonic when we see the full picture of him. Yeah, it was good what happened with Sanders. It wasn't where I wanted it to go down, in my opinion, but it was still good. It was a lot better how Sanders ends as a villain rather than Dr. Tulp ends as a villain. And yeah, the Roof Inheritance really does a good ending cliffhanger, which leads into Series 3. Now to characters and performances. We'll start with Jago and Lightfoot. Jago first connected to the Roof and plot. And then Lightfoot eventually get into it to catalogue the bones with Saka. Yeah, they were good in this audio. Split apart almost the entire audio. Not sure about that. But then they joined together during the ending scenes. Next up is Ellie and what was going on with her is concluded in this series. And she takes a little bit of a backseat in Series 3 and she did a lot to do in Series 2. I think it's coming her down a little bit as... Well, if you know who's in Series 3, she's taking the top role and not Ellie. Now for the villain of the story, Gabriel Sanders. Good, of course, but I wish she was introduced a bit earlier. That's all I wanted, and it would have been brilliant for Gabriel Sanders. Lord Rufin, and he's a very interesting character going from place to place, telling things about Jago and then to Lightfoot to catalogue the bones. I can't remember who voiced Lord Rufin or Simon Williams. Next up we have Dr. Saka, who is good in this story, he's one of my favourite characters of the series, believe it or not, I just love him. 
He was better in Theatre of Dreams. I think he had more to do in that one than the Beloved Devil. But he was cataloging the bones with Lightfoot. Then Sergeant Quick. I think he only had scenes at the start and at the end. Which was okay. Not used too much. And we have just a creature voiced by Alex Madison. Which I think is either the creature from the middle part in the catacombs. Or the creature during the end. I don't know which one it is. It might be both of them. So then, what is my final verdict on the Rufin Inheritance? Yeah, it's a good story. I do find it a bit overrated in my opinion. I don't think it is a great end for the box set, but I would say it's a good end. Because it took far too long to do everything, because it had so much build up and then we have to have this long, tedious wait for it to happen. And I wanted it to happen in an instant or five minutes or just get to the roofing house immediately. It just took a bit too long. Gabriel Sanders was good in the audio, but I think he shines more in life than Sanders. So I give the Rufin Inheritance a 7.5 out of 10. I don't think it deserves an 8. As I said, I find it quite overrated in my opinion. But still a good story nonetheless. 7.5 is still a very high rating. So that was my review of each of the stories. Now I'm going to do a recap and place them in order from 4th place to 1st place. And then say my overall verdict on the box set. So 4th place it is, yeah, the Rufin Inheritance. Sadly, the last story in the set is my lowest. A good story, but how it flowed and the pacing, I think it just took too long for the story to get into gear. Especially the Reuven plot, that took quite a while, unfortunately, for Lightfoot and Saka to get into the plot, where they're doing the cataloging of the bones. But yeah, it's a good story, but I wanted a little bit more out of it. Third place it is Mark Morris. The Necropolis Express. I was thinking this one would be my least favourite, but no, it's my third favourite. It actually did overwhelm me. I was thinking it was going to be my least favourite, maybe like a 7 out of 10, but no, it gets a 9 out of 10. It's quite fun in places, yet it has some very surprising twists and turns. Very creepy, quite serious storytelling and bleak. So yeah, you can tell what the story is trying to do, what is his direction. But yeah, it's still a really good story by Mark Morris. A great improvement over, or I should say a fantastic improvement over Moonflash. Second place, it is Jonathan Morris's The Theatre of Dreams. An extremely clever story. It's a lot of fun. The voice acting in this is perfect. It's so full of energy and it feels like everyone is enjoying this. Madden Deuteronomy, Fosco, Jago, Lightfoot, all of them. They feel like they're having such a fun blast. Well done to all the voice actors in this one. It's perfect. It's just so full of life. So that was second place to Future of Dreams. And my favourite is Lightfoot and Sanders with a 10. Out of 10, it's good old Hammer Horror for me. And Sanders is so really good in this one. And Justin Richard really does play about with the main characters, Jago and Lightfoot. Really talented writing by Justin Richards. And I hope he delivers a really strong story again. Dead Men's Tale is the first story in Series 3. So hopefully, he will keep it up. So then, what is my final verdict on Jago and Lightfoot Series 2? What is one of my most favourite releases out of my entire collection? It even gives Dark Eyes 1 a run for its money. And that's saying something. It is a whopping box set. All the stories are great and three of them being bloody outstanding. A 7.5, a 9 out of 10, a 9.5, and a 10 out of 10. Really good ratings in this set, and I give the box set a 9 out of 10. That's very hard for a box set to achieve, as all the stories have to pretty much all be good for it to get a 9. And if the Roof and Inheritance got a, a 9 out of 10, I would give this set a 9.5, and that would be a very high rating for a box set. So thank you very much for watching my review of Jago and Lightfoot Series 2. Of course, I'm going to be reviewing the other Jiggle and Lightfoot series. Series 3 will be out sometime soon. And of course, Series 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. So we enjoy those reviews when they come up in the future. But anyway, have a fantastic week. And I'll see you in the next one for Doom Coalition. It's still taking some time to get that review out. So hope you enjoy it when it comes out. Goodbye and have a good one. <laughs>